Yeah, thanks a lot for having us. Um, uh, as Joel said, my name is uh, Gabriel Krumenacher. I work for Sulke as a data scientist. Um, this is joint work with uh, Beat Wettstein uh, from SPB. I think he's going to briefly introduce himself as well. Um, we promised um, to talk about leveraging neural networks in Python um, to forecast train delays in the SPB network. We slightly changed um, the topic to leveraging neural networks in Python to forecast disruptions in the Swiss Relay network. Um, this is still, uh, it's like the first stage um, to predict delays. Um, but Beat is going to briefly um, talk to you about what disruptions are and what they mean and why they're important. Um, but first, um, let's also start with a video. It's a bit more boring, there's no rockets in it. Um, but it's, it illustrates um, um, what we were doing. Um, so on the right hand side on top, um, you can see all these text messages um, and they're related to all the red dots you can see on the Swiss map. Um, so the red dots and on top there's a time and date. Um, these are all disruptions to the network and for now, or for all of the talk, you can think of a disruption just as a train cannot run at this point because something happened to the track, for instance. Um, so these are all different um, disruptions in the network and the text you can see scrolling is messages um, related to these disruptions. So there's people that try to fix these such that the trains can run again um, and they have some tool where they enter messages, um, unstructured text um, uh, like a chat tool um, to, about these disruptions and that they're going there to fix it. Um, and since we use machine learning, um, at the bottom you can see the weights of our neural network, um, basically learning to predict how long it's going to take to, um, to, to solve these disruptions. Um, so you can see that um, it should start um, initially um, random, um, and then over time the network learns, so these weights um, um, start to, to get some meaning, and over time um, the accuracy increases. So over the more and more data we see, the more and more um, examples we have about these disruptions and, and these text messages, um, our prediction is going to get better. So um, in this talk, um, first we're going to talk about what the disruption is, then uh, machine learning with text data, because these are text messages. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce some text features that we used. And then sequence models, um, like how can we model um, something that's not just independent data points. Um, I'm going to show the, like what the model looks like that we came up with to predict these um, disruptions and then uh, what we try to do with this now. But first, Beat is going to, to show you about disruptions. Thank you so much. Hi there. <laughs> it's nice here. <laughs> My name is uh, Beat Wettstein. I'm working for the platform for science and innovation by the SUV, the Swiss Railway Company. This is not so nice, <laughs> it's, it's a disruption. Um, the Swiss Railway Company has about th more than 3,000 km of, of lines and approximately 400 disruptions per day. And if you have a disruption, this is just a semantic, uh, symbolic um, diagram. You see the aspect of productivity and the time. If you have a disruption in this example at time one, the productivity is not going down at this point. It's going a little bit later. And then it's low until three, T3. But then an incident team go to the point of the disruption and fix the problem. And after T3, uh, some trains can't drive anymore, can, can drive now, but they have still, still some delays. A delays mean you have a, um, a difference, a delay difference between, uh, between the timetable, about 180 seconds. And after T5, we have a normal operation system again. And this disruption duration, this is our topic, what we want to, to make a forecast. The next uh, slide, you see a diagram with the, we could say, entropy of disruption information, also a symbolical diagram. Um, you see it just behind the other graph at T1 until T2. This is a call, a time period is calling um, chaos fast. You cannot make a prediction or you can, it's difficult to make a prediction, you have almost no information about in this phase. But soon 
of the T2, the operation manager or dispatcher will receive more and more information. He see on his screen, or oh, the train is not there, and he, he found information about that. The problem is now, you want to make a prediction at T1 or at T2, because it's not useful to do it at T5 for our customer. And that is the case that we make um, text language. We will, I will tell you that more, or I will tell you from that more. First, I show you a, a business application. This is a business application for the dispatcher. You see on the left top, um, the point where the disruptions are at the moment, then all case on the top, and behind the text messages. Text messages not structured, only text like a chat tool. They write it down. And Gabriel will explain you more how we can use this text message for a very good prediction. But first, I inform you about another helpful feature for the neural net. If you have, a, for example, a power cut, like in this picture, an incident team has to go to the place of the disruption. But sometimes they cannot go by train, so the, the, line, the line is closed. They use the car for that. But we can use a, make a calculation with Google Maps to find out how, will, how long will they take to the place of the disruption. And this time is a very helpful feature because it's included in the duration. You see here the Python code. And you need first to transform from the Swiss coordinate to the world coordinate, otherwise the rocket will go another place. <laughs> and then this is the is a GPS converter, you can use it from Swiss Topo. And then you can use the um, G -Map, uh, so Google Maps service. For that you need an address and the coordinates of the place. The address is from the incident team. Every, also every, every incident team has an address and we can calculate for all operation turns that you have um, the, the travel time. Or then we have a very helpful feature. But now Gabriel will explain more how we can use this uh, text message to make a prediction. Thanks. Right, so the goal is, uh, again, to predict uh, the duration of these disruptions. And here's an example of one. Um, as Beat said, uh, one <coughs> helpful feature is the the location, so this is, uh, we have this information, this is uh, like an SVB code for where on the network um, something was happening. Uh, we also know some kind of type of the disruption, so here's something happened to some signal, um, and we have a time. And then over time these messages come in, so uh, first they just know that something with a switch point that is 122A switch point is wrong, um, then they say, okay, we cannot go from Basel to uh, Bodischer Bahnhof, I guess, to some other Bahnhof. Um, and they, they say that they called someone to go fix this and so on. So the goal is that to, after a certain amount of time, maybe 10 minutes, we can take these messages and where this is and try to predict how long it's going to take um, um, to fix this, like when the end of the duration is. Uh, we're going to feed all of this into our amazing machine learning model and then we can predict um, this uh, disruption time. The goal is to be able to use this prediction um, for scheduling. So when the dispatcher knows, um, has some estimate of how long this is going to take, he can reroute trains differently. And also the uh, customers might um, want this information so they know that, okay, this is going to take two hours to fix, probably no train will run um, from Basel to uh, some other point in Basel. Okay, so um, the, 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 the remainder of this talk is going to be out about this middle part um, and how we use Python, uh, TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, Keras, and Pandas uh, mostly um, um, to, to solve this problem. So um, I'm briefly going to introduce um, supervised text classification because this is um, the, the, the problem that we, like we framed it in a, in, a, in a supervised text classification problem. So for a moment, forget about trains. Um, the task is now um, to do document classification. So imagine you have some set of documents and they have a, a, a label. So they have a different category. For instance, you have letters, you have blog posts, you have news articles, um, any kind of, of categories, and you have a training set of these. So you have 
someone, some, some intern annotated um, these documents for you. Um, and this is very important, otherwise you cannot do supervised classification, you need supervision. So this is called a label and it's usually called Y. Um, okay, so we can take this training data and the goal is now using this training data to um, find a function f that maps, that does this automatically. So this represents the intern um, and it goes from documents to um, categories. And for instance, um, with scikit-learn, you could use a random forest classifier. It's just one, one kind of um, um, supervised classification method um, and, and use this um, to do the prediction for you. Um, you can then go uh, use this random forest classifier uh, and fit it on the training data. So you can use all the data that you have annotations for, um, that you know the graph truth, you know this is a letter, a blog post, or a news article, or you could use some Keras uh, neural network um, and fit this on, the, on this data. And then the goal is to use test data that you don't have annotations for. Um, maybe your intern's sick. Um, and then you can use your classifier um, to predict um, on this data. So now you, you can automate this process of reading the document and deciding this is a letter someone wrote, or this was a blog post, or this was a news article. Um, all right, so first, um, before we can actually train this classifier, we need to construct some features out of our text. And one that Beat showed was for our disruptions, we could use, for instance, the time it takes for the team to go there. Um, but now we want to also read these messages, basically, um, because they contain very useful information. And for this, we need to create text features. So we need another function first and apply it to our document and then get some vectors because this is what um, these machine learning models work with. You need some list of, of numbers that you can then give to your classifier. Um, there's, there we use pandas, there's scansim, there's, we didn't use spacey, but there's like a lot of very helpful Python toolboxes that uh, you can use to work with text data and uh, use some of them to, to um, create um, features out of our our text documents. Okay, so the goal is to get this vector. Um, uh, imagine like this, right? So we want to find this matrix X um, that we can then use for machine learning. So we take all our documents and for each document we apply this feature generation function G and in the end we get our nice um, um, training data. So this matrix is um, the size of the documents that we have and the size of this vector. So each document gets a vector assigned to it. And then we can take these vectors um, and apply our machine learning model um, F and this will then use the vector and predict that this was a blog post. And this we can use scikit-learn for, for instance, so we can take the model, we fit it on this training data that we converted into, into these nice numeric matrices and these NumPy arrays and then we can use um, the test data that we also transformed and, and predict the test data and get the predictions for. Um, so this is uh, basically um, the two-stage procedure. Um, so here I'm going to show you some examples of, of text features and also some that we also used. So say that you have three documents. Uh, Python is the best, Python is great for machine learning, Python is great um, are, are your documents, so how can you represent them? And the easiest uh, way to do this, or the, the, the most basic one, is just to um, construct this dictionary. So you have a dictionary of words. This is, these are all the words in all the documents. And then for the first document, this would be your vector representing this. So you get a one if the word occurs in your document or a zero if it doesn't. So here you would have Python is the best and then all the others are zero. The same for all the rest. This is called bag of words. And this is like the basic representation of text. So now you can map your documents into vectors. And you can do this with scikit-learn, it's called count vectorizer, and you can yeah, fit, transform your training documents and get this matrix. Now, slightly smarter would be to not just count, um, but also to look at the frequency of the word in the document and of the document, um, of the word in all the documents. Um, so this is called TF-IDF, and it's very similar to counting, but instead of the count, you take the frequency of the word in the document. So um, here Python would be one over four uh, instead of just one. Plus you look at all the other documents and then you normalize um, by how often Python appears in all the other documents. So since this is in all of them, it's, it's, not, um, its occurrence is not that um, important. Um, so it gets discounted. And this is called a TF-IDF vectorizer. 
Okay, so this is nice, but there are two problems um, with this representation or with this type of representation. You get these really large sparse vectors that are mostly zero because most words don't occur in your document. Um, and you ignore the similarity between words. So best and great are very similar, um, like they have a similar meaning, but now they're just some, some dimension in this vector. Um, plus, the structure is completely ignored. You just take all your words, put them in a bag. It doesn't matter like what comes first. Um, so the first, I'm going to show you how you can deal with um, the word similarity issue and then with the sentence structure issue. So the sentence, so the word, um, the word meaning um, issue is dealt with um, um, something called word embeddings. So um, instead of looking at the whole document, now we're looking at just one word, and we want to find a vector for just a word. So you want to find a function that you can give a word to, and then it gives you this vector. Um, and you do this by first doing the same as before with the documents. It's called one-hot encoding. Um, you just take your dictionary of words, and then for each word, it's the vector is the size of the dictionary, everything zero but one where the word is in the dictionary. So for great, you would have a vector, all zeros, and the second dimension would be one, because it's the section, second word in the dictionary. And then you use this and you find an embedding that gives you these dense, small feature vectors um, that you are interested in per word. And there's different ways to do it. The most popular is called word to vec um, It's uh, also implemented in Gensim, this um, toolbox I mentioned before. And this gives you vectors where really they're close in this space if, if they occur in similar context. So if they're similar, so great and best would be similar here. Or you can also train these embedding function like you train the classifier function at the same time so that you get embeddings that work well for your task. But you still have no sentence structure, right? Now you have just a set of these vectors. I mean, you could average them, but that's probably not the best thing you can do. So the last thing um, that we use in the model is um, called the recurrent neural network. Um, and this is uh, a neural network model that you can use if you have data that's not just independent data points, but sequences that have some correlation over time um, or over the sequence. So uh, imagine text, audio, um, some other signals, uh, time series. Um, and these, are, these can be modeled um, um, with a recurrent neural network. So what is it? It's um, multiple functions. Um, so you have these arrows, um, 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 they, they mean uh, a function is applied. So here you have a function w, u, and o, and here's your input at time, time step t. So at each time step you have a function that um, maps your input to some um, hidden um, state, and then you get an output at that time point. And at the same time, so this arrow basically is the recurrent part of the recurrent neural network. Um, all over time, these are combined. Um, so you get these states, um, C, and this is basically this diagram unrolled. And now you can enter your words as the feature vectors that you computed before over time, and you apply the same function to them. You get some hidden state, and then the hidden state has a recurrence over time. So now if we look at best, we not only compute um, a function of best to um, get the output of what, what um, document category this is, but also we take into account the state that the network had at the time step before, which encodes basically everything that, that was in this sentence before. Um, and now we don't, now it matters um, at which, in which order these words are entered into the network. Um, so this solves the last issue. But also we could look at these disruptions and this is basically what we're doing. So the messages arrive over time. So we feed the messages one by one when they enter, um, uh, when someone enters the message. And then at each time step we can update our duration prediction. So at at time step two, we, we have a prediction for duration. At the last time step, we have a prediction for how, how long the disruption uh, will take. And these are just feature vectors of our, of our messages. OK, um, and this you could use. Uh, we, we did use uh, Keras for. Um, LSTM is a, is, a, is a type of recurrent neural network. Um, and then uh, the model has basically the size of the sequence, so the length of the sequence, the number of features you have in your vectors, and then like how many how many numbers you assign to this hidden state, and then you, you can have this model. So 
So um, we used all of this um, to come up with our final model for the, the prediction of this um, disruption uh, duration. So uh, first, uh, we, I mean, okay, that's not true. This is how you could do it. We, we didn't use the, um, the LSTM over words yet. Anyway, so here's if, how you could combine everything that I just said. So you take a word, you compute this embedding vector from it, you feed it into your um, recurrent sequence model, then the next word, and so on. So until you have a representation for the whole first message that someone entered. You can feed this in, an, in a second recurrent model um, that now takes messages, right? So you can, you can have all these words that are a sequence, and then you have a sequence over these uh, messages, and at the end you get some output. Um, so these are all uh, functions that you, that you learn. And then you want to combine this at the end with all the other um, um, things that you know about your disruption. So where was the disruption? Um, when did this happen? At what time? And so on. Um, and, and finally, um, you output the predicted duration. So what we did was we took one year of all the disruptions in, um, in, the, in the SPP network, um, in German-speaking Switzerland, so we didn't have to deal with multiple languages. Um, we looked at one type of these disruptions, um, um, and we used an LSTM over um, these frequency features um, per message. And then we get these results. So we didn't predict um, uh, real values for the duration, but we predicted these different classes. So we can predict now if, um, if the disruption is going to be short, like uh, 15 minutes, or if it's going to be a bit longer, 15 between 30 minutes and so on, or if it will take over two hours to fix it. Um, we compared different models after seeing um, a different amount of messages. So this random baseline is just um, the best you can do without looking at the labels at all, uh, without looking at the data at all. Um, uh, so you get 19%. If you do something really stupid, you get 19% um, of the clauses correct. And if you don't look at the text at all, but just at where was this um, taking place, how long is it going to team to fix it, and you put it into a random forest um, classifier, you already get 33%. Um, correct classification. And then if you lose a linear model over this text feature, logistic regression, for 10 minutes you get 37, and then with our model after 10 minutes you get 40% um, accuracy. And then the more of these messages you see, um, the, more, uh, the, the, the better your, your, your model is. But this is not very useful. So after an hour, um, if you can only um, uh, predict it the, the time it will take after an hour, this is maybe not very useful. So after 10 minutes is maybe, maybe a good point to output the prediction. <laughs> I told you already uh, we are working by the platform for um, science and innovation. And this is, was just a, a model now. And we have now some uh, from our internal co customers um, questioned how we can integrate this in, in our um, company. And but for the next step, we will only build a prototype. And we want to install this prototype, um, you see it on top, by the operation dispatcher, that I can see what, is, what could be the duration. But um, the operation manager still has to decide what is the, the, the time what you want to communicate to the customer. But somewhere in the year, uh, in, in some years, <laughs> We want to uh, integrate it also in, a, in our um, mobile app. But I think it takes a while. <laughs> okay. Then we are on the end of the presentation. Thank you, Gabriel and Beat. Um, we have time for a few questions. Let's start over there. Hey, um, what was the size of your embedding vector? How many iterations did you train it? And how large was the training set? So the size of, so we, so we didn't use uh, word embeddings um, in the end. Um, so we just used TFIDF um, for documents. I think I limited it to a couple hundred, like 200 or so um, of the most uh, frequently occurring words. Um, what was your second question? 
Well, okay. New second question. Um, why didn't you do regression? I mean, it seems like a regression problem. Why did you do classification? Uh, because this was already um, somehow enough um, uh, granularity. So these are basically um, from the business the important say, um, um, durations to, to be able to um, uh, distinguish. It doesn't really, I mean, the problem is if you put it, if you frame it as a, just as a regression problem, um, like if you mispredict one or two minutes, or say five or ten minutes counts the same as mispredicting 225 or um, 230 minutes. Um, in a way, we can encode what, what's really an important, if, like what's an important mistake. It's somehow more important if it takes 15 minutes or over two hours than being able to um, like have very good accuracy or, or, or small error in like, uh, it, if it takes over two hours, it doesn't matter how, how long it takes somehow. All right, thanks. Um, did you compare the results you had, the 40% with like um, so humans categorizing these, these text messages and the information? Or how do, how do humans estimate those delays? Uh, we don't know. Yeah, but they have a lot of oh, okay. experience about that. <laughs> because the dispatcher, I think they have operation sentence in the Switzerland, and they, they, they work every time, and they have a lot of experience in their head. Okay, so they're better than 40%. I, I uh, that, 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 at that moment, it it's very difficult. <laughs> but, but it's something we should do. I mean, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. it would be nice to know. Yeah. That is the reason that we build a bot prototype and put, also to install that, so they have a web application then, um, in the operation center. And then they can decide which one they want to choose. <laughs> well, maybe you can take the estimate of the operator as an input feature, as a cheap way to use their neural network. But my question is, <laughs> um, for evaluating your score, how do, you, how do you deal with the fact that some of the classes are impossible. So, for example, if you do your accuracy after one hour, some of the classes are now impossible. How do you deal with that in, like, mathematically? We ignore it. I mean, after, so, it's the same. I mean, if, I, I agree. I'm, after one hour, we still predict all the classes. Um, we don't, um, so it's, in a way, harder because we don't exclude the classes that we already know are impossible, but it's also easier because um, you've seen all the the information. Yeah. I mean, the goal is to have a reasonably accurate prediction after 10 minutes or so. And then all the classes are still possible. Let's do one more question. <laughs> Could I just, okay, let's do this one in four. What is your best hope uh, for the highest accuracy in one year? But, don't know how to answer it. <laughs> okay, that was a quick one. Maybe okay. you can. <laughs> so the the text messages that are sent back to the dispatch are they uh, like from a fixed set of responses they can give, or they're actually typed character for character? Yeah, no. So it's really they. Uh, it's like you write something on WhatsApp. They could they could make mistakes. Also. Yes, yes, they do. Yeah. They use <laughs> yeah. Yeah, one is, yeah, one is like with, character level embeddings yeah. to add enough data. And just use the character. You need. Sorry, I didn't get that. I mean, you can do character level embeddings as well. Like no, we don't, but it's something we could, we could also look at. Yeah, I agree. All right. It's on the same direction as, as him. Um, I assume that after a certain point of period of time, you have like a small vocabulary that, that they are using. So what if instead of a pretext, they have like a template where you can, you can put like um, very defined and specific, specified things that define this, this disruption. So like building a dictionary for the dispatcher. 
You know, I think at the first, this is just for chatting, this one. But we have, they have also other uh, text prepared, or um, so concepts. But this is uh, complicated to explain. But uh, for, this, for this message at the beginning, they have just plain text in uh, writing mistakes and also in different languages and with shortcuts and everything that. This is the content now at the beginning. I think in general the problem is always, I mean, you can somehow force the people to do something very structured that's then much easier to, to do the predictions, but this, this data is not entered for this, right? So the data is entered, they want to solve the disruption. They, the people that use the system, they don't care about, I mean, in a way they care about how long it takes because they can influence this, but they, they don't enter these messages for us. Um, so for them, it should be really easy to like organize this, and I think that's why it's in the way it is. Um, and I think as soon as you make uh, an application for reporting, the people that use it, they don't really have an incentive to use it well. I mean, if you give them categories, and this all also exists, and it's just bad, because people, they want to do their job quickly, and they'll just, they know they can only go on in the application if they, if they select some categories, they will just select the first one. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think it's still important to be able to deal with this unstructured data. All right, let's close it with this. Let's thank them again.